welcome everybody. Um, I'm David Levy, and this is the great, and I mean that, the great Judge Gerald Bard Joe Flat, who's really um, just had the most remarkable career on the on the federal bench and started actually on the Florida state bench. And let, let me just acknowledge Judge Rosenberg in the yeah. in the audience here, a Duke Law graduate who's a U.S. District Judge in yes. the Middle District and Florida, and it's just doing a, a wonderful job, too. So um, it's nice that Duke has this tradition of uh, graduating students who become judges. And yes. It's, uh, it's really important. Why not? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> they got to do something. That's why. <laughs> so uh, we're going to be talking about your your life on the bench, and... Uh, it's just it's just so amazing. So you first served on the Fourth Judicial Circuit Court of Florida from yes. sixty eight to seventy. Yes. Then you were appointed by President Nixon, who was a Duke Law graduate. Yes. And maybe there that wasn't entirely by coincidence uh, to the District Court for the Middle District of Florida. Uh, that was in nineteen seventy. And then uh, President Ford appointed appointed you to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals in nineteen seventy five. And, and my commission is countersigned by your father. I, <laughs> so this is a family event. <laughs> Gerald Ford, Levy. Yeah, well, my, my father was attorney general. My father was attorney general. And then when the Fifth Circuit was split, uh, you went with the Eleven. Yes. Uh, because that's where Florida is. And uh, you eventually became chief judge of that circuit from 1989 to 1996. And it was only in 2019 that you took senior status, which is a, a, a form of, uh, it's not retirement, but it gives you greater discretion over how much, how much work you want to do. Yeah, how much work you want to do. And, um, and you, you told me just a few minutes ago that you're keeping a full load. So that means you've got a full complement of law clerks, yes. I think, and you're very busy. Yeah, there, here you are. Um, you've been a, a judge for 54 years, and a you are the longest serving federal court of appeals judge in history. Yeah, in active service. In active service. Yes, that's amazing. Well, just how do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> you must like the work. Uh, they call it genes or something. Well, I think it is genes. But um, so you've you know you've had this most remarkable career, and you have all these terrific law clerks, and we're celebrating your 50 years, and one of the ways that we're, well, more than 50 years, one of the ways that your law clerks have been doing this, and the, and the law school, is to record the record of your, your life, uh, your life of service, and you've been doing this with your law clerks, I think you say, on Friday afternoon. On Friday, for about 10 months. <laughs> for about 10 months. And we, I, oral history, they call it. It's an oral history. I think you've already done something like 15 hours. Uh, and something like It's that. going to be a, truly a treasure trove for um, future historians of the courts because you've, you've just you've seen so much and you've had this remarkable career and impact in, in so many different areas. So many of the things that we take for granted now, you were part of the group of judges that... Uh, at the time, drove these reforms. So yeah. you, you know a great deal about sentencing and um, the administration of the probation system, uh, the organization, the administrative organization of the courts, and and all of that is being covered by your your law clerks. Um, but today we thought that we would focus on your relationship with the law school um, with Duke. Uh, you're a 1957 graduate of, of the law school, and you've you've been among the most loyal and active uh, alumni that we have. I was dean of the law school for 11 years, and you were you were you were there for me, and you were always there for the school, and you were there for my my predecessors and and for my successors. Our our federal federalist chapter is named for you. It's the jury Joe Flat. Uh, Federalist chapter, and I'm sure that if ACS could name their chapter after you, they would as well. Uh, there's a scholarship in your name. You've hired 
more than 110 uh -oh. <laughs> well, Duke Law students. If I went back to practicing law, uh, Bill Adams, there were the top three graduates in the, in the Duke class of 1950 came to Jacksonville. So then the, and I and I practice law with them. So that would be 113. Well, and it's still going strong. We, we started hiring law for, uh, hiring Duke students in 1958. So the three of us did. That's pretty good. And, and every year after that, while I practiced law, the 1968. So probably it was called a Duke firm in Jacksonville. As a matter of fact, uh, some alumni who were big clients who were Florida people were grumbling about it. why don't you go down there to Gainesville and hire a bunch of people. But, so Well, you're the Full Employment Act for... Uh, <laughs> and then I've hired the clerks every year since I've been on the bed. Yeah, well, we all owe you big time. Uh, so you started in Pittsburgh. Uh, you, were, you were born in 1929. And why don't we, why don't we cover a little bit of the early history? Because you... Um, you, you, you were not born to a well-to-do family, and you, um, your, your, your folks were immigrants. You were a baseball player, apparently. Yeah. Right? would be baseball player. And you were pretty good. <laughs> not that. But you got a scholarship to, yeah, to, to yeah. The UVA. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and, um, and that's, where you, that's where you went. Uh, you started your undergraduate. Yeah. Thing. But then for... Financial reasons, I think you went to. You, you ended up at the University of Cincinnati. Yeah. And you started law school there. Yeah. And then, and then, what happened? How, how did you, How did you end up at Duke? Well, uh, the the Korean War was hot in in 1951-52, uh, and and I had a draft board that didn't like me or anybody else. I think <laughs> so. I was in the first year of law school and. It, Christmas Eve, I got greetings to report at the induction center on January the 15th. And that was the day of mid-year exams. So I, I went to the induction center and everybody else went to, went, to, went to exams. And so then I was in the, drafted into the infantry because back in those days you went to infantry rifleman replacement, MOS they call it, military occupational specialty. Then they would put you on a train and send you to Fort Lewis, Washington, put you on a boat and go to Japan and then Korea. And so everybody fell out, the 200 in the company, and he called my, my name out and said, you step aside. And, and it turned out I was sent to the counterintelligence corps, uh, Army Intelligence Corps school in Baltimore. And from there, I was supposed to go to Presidio Monet and learn Chinese because were, the Chinese were heavily involved in the Korean conflict at that time. But the chat, but the school was full, so I wound up as a special agent in the counterintelligence corps doing FBI type work, I guess you'd call it, in Roanoke, Virginia, and then got out. And when and I went, at Christmas time, I I went to see the dean of the law school here. No, in oh. Cincinnati. I said, I'm getting out on, on the 14th of, of January. Exams are going to be on the 15th for the night. And I said, do you think I could take the exams with this class two behind? He said, if you're, if you're a glutton for punishment, I'll go long. Yeah. So I took exam. I got out on Friday and took exams Monday. I uh, start that week. Yeah. And well, then I finished Cincinnati. The first year, I, I won, it's a regional law school, and I, and I talked to him about going to a, a school of wider, and he said, go to Duke. And, uh, Isn't that interesting? Any idea why, why he said He just said, go to Duke. And I was, a, I was Sounds good, right? I was the best man in the wedding of a, of a guy in the counterintelligence corps who was from Laurenburg. So I'm driving to Laurenburg, and I stopped in Durham, and, uh, and met with the dean. And that would have been Jack Laddie. Yeah, no, time. that wasn't Jack Laddie. Who was? It was. Uh, Could that have been Horace? Well, he went. To, he he quit. The, he retired the next year. And went to Tampa. And became a senator in Florida. Oh. Joe Joe McLean. Okay. And Joe McLean was dean. He said, "If you've done all right, I didn't know what my grades were. If you did all right, because only if turned out was all right. So now I'm in Durham." And so, uh, I finished here, 
And um, uh, we were getting married in July and wanted to go someplace we didn't know anybody. Wanted to go to New York. My wife-to-be said, now let's go someplace else. We didn't know anybody. I got an offer or two from Florida and went there. Yeah. And so that was... Well, you know, in that... That was the end of that. In that the time, beginning of that. In the, the beginning of that. In yeah. that time, a lot... It's still true, but a lot of Duke Law graduates um, then either they stayed in North Carolina or they went to Florida or, or Atlanta or Texas. It was very... It was, it was somewhat more directed that way. Yeah. Uh, some went to New York and D.C., but I think not so. Not not the way it is. If you were to compare it to now, where lots of students go to New York, D.C., California, it was less less true with them. Well, what was your experience like at, at Duke? We were you, you were over on the West Campus in the West Campus next to Perkins. The, this well, building, the class of thirty six. This building wasn't here. You had a, a you class had, of thirty six. So you were called on every day. Yeah. <laughs> A, a, a kind of a different, a, yeah. a, a different environment. And uh, what, what would you say your favorite classes were? Do you, re, you recall? Oh my! Well, Jack Laddie, and Doug Maggs, and and, and Pascal. There, there was, there was uh, a, there a lot of the professors had been there a long time. Yeah, Th they were there. A lot of them in the thirties. When, when when the law school was basically built. Then it was started in the in the mid thirties. Yeah, yeah, and that was a great group. Uh, people may not know this, but when when Duke was founded, when the university was founded in the mid thirties, the law the law school just kind of sprang onto the stage, and it had a lot of money, and it, they went around the country and they tried to poach the very very best people from around the around the nation. I think that uh, Richard Nixon's class, which I think was thirty six eight. Was on scholarship. Yeah, I think they were entirely on scholarship. The whole class, just about. Yeah. So uh, in the in the nineteen fifties, though, this was the period uh, after the war, and um, and Duke, at, at least initially, didn't do very well after the war. It, a lot of the law schools during the war, um, they at that time it was mostly or all men. So their their enrollment was way down. Duke and UNC actually combined during World War II. And yes. That, um, and then after the war, the schools were flooded with GIs with GIs yeah. coming back. And but Duke not so much. And Jack Laddie, who had been the dean, um, I think just before. well, it was Joe McLean and then Dale Stansberry, who taught evidence and contracts and been here a long time. Yeah. Uh, he was dean for about two years, and Jack Laddie. And then Laddie, but Laddie, uh, he went to the he went to the board of trustees at one point in the nineteen fifties and said, "The school, you know, we may have to close the law school because it had not rebounded the way some of the other schools had." Um, but when you, by the time you got here, I think people, it, it was it was looking up, and uh, in, in the late fifties, yeah, we were looked, ready to go. We were ready to go, yeah. and then they built this building. Yeah. And, yeah, and then they, they took off. Okay, so you graduated um, in 57, Seven. and you end up in, in Florida, and you're, you're practicing law. Um, how, is it, how do you become a judge? Well, how does that happen? Well, I'm practicing with these Duke lawyers. I, I was blessed with, with great law partners in the practice of law. Uh, we had the largest firm in Jacksonville by the time I went on the bench, which was... 28, to give you some ice. Uh, I think we started out with uh, about six or seven, over, over about a 10 year period, uh, went to 28 or so. And we had great clients, uh, just, well anyhow, how I'm on the bench is a, is a freaky sort of thing. Florida had the first Republican governor since Reconstruction in 1968 just by pure accident. Uh, anyhow, there were, uh, the state judges in those days, there were 11 of us for three counties. And they, uh, it, it, under Florida law, you ran in a, in a partisan election for the judiciary, like they do in North Carolina, say, for all, for all the courts. Uh, and, and if, you, if a, a judge died midterm, the governor would appoint for the balance. So a judge named Jones, and this is the spring of, uh, of 68, uh, died, and uh, 
about the time of the Florida Bar was meeting, and I was in Miami, and I got back on Monday from the weekend of the Florida Bar meeting, and somebody said, I happened to be a Republican. There weren't any Republicans. <laughs> As a matter of fact, when I came to Florida, I went down to register, and they just get, they said, you're going to register as a Democrat. I said, no, I, I'm a Taft Republican. Let me, no, no. You had, so I registered as a Republican. Which, they said, you can't vote. You can vote in the general election, but that's all. <laughs> so anyway. So, so some clients, but parties didn't much matter then in those days. And some clients told the governor, we need to put this guy on the, on the bench and, and uh, I had two children, uh, one was 10, one was eight, uh, but well, might as well, so I was appointed that June 18, 1968. Now I had to run in the next general election for four and a half years left in the term. That meant November of 68, that was a presidential year. And that would be massacre because the Democrats uh, out registered the Republicans in the three counties by 95 to 5. So anyway, so I, I took the job. I told my partners, I'll see you in January. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, down I went, and I have it, was having a good time. Had no campaign. I qualified to vote. No campaign treasure, no nothing. And, uh, and I was trying a case uh, before a jury in August, the last day of registration. And I thought there would be three or four uh, Democrat lawyers who had served, who had been prosecutors and had name recognition. And uh, I remember that the jury's in the box and the clerk came through the door in the back of the courtroom and I told him to be at ease. He came along sidebar, he said, Judge, you don't have an opponent. No. <laughs> That's the best guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so in November, uh, the precincts, uh, the, the registrar of, of elections, who was a good friend, he said, I don't want you to get the big head, but I'm going to give you something. And it showed the precincts in the three counties. And some precincts would be like this. Hubert Humphrey, 890. Nixon, 2. Choflat, 2. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm, on the, now I'm on the state bench. And, and a, 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 a vacancy occurred on the federal district bench two years later. And so that... That's where I went. That's where you went. Um, and let's, let's, let's talk about a couple of things here that are part of your, part of your story. Um, so becoming a, a, a U.S. district judge, every, every, every judge has their own path to the bench, and they're all a little bit different. Um, but yours is, um, your, yours is different because, because Nixon was a Duke Law graduate. Yeah. And... I'm sure that didn't hurt. Um, well, uh, 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 Dean Laddie sent me a note, a copy of a letter that he wrote, and it was Dear Dick. Yeah. <laughs> so he wrote to the president, uh, touting my appointment. Yeah, you know. it didn't hurt. No, it didn't. <laughs> and, you know, I have a, a, a different story, but the, the point um, that, I'm, that I'd make here is just that my law school, which was Stanford, when I decided I wanted to be a judge, they got behind me and the former dean, Paul Brast, and my con law professor, Jerry Gunther, they all, they, they all wrote letters. I, I don't know uh, how much effect they had, but probably, you know, I, my guess is quite considerable. Um, well, by the, time, by the time the federal uh, position opened, which was, as I say, two years, I, I already had a reputation on the state bench. Yeah. And there was a reputation in that part of Florida. Uh, for example, we never had contested elections on the state court at all. Whoever appointed you or however you were elected, you stayed. <coughs> and so uh, there wasn't a lot of hullabaloo about that federal vacancy. Right. Uh, but the story really is that I got there by happenstance. I mean, it was just the last thing in the world I was thinking about doing. Um. But let's let's talk some more about um, two things because you and I have discussed this, and they're, 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 I think we share it to some extent. Part part of your history is that which you've discussed is that you decided to go to a smaller location, a mid mid sized city, um, where you became a lawyer and where you practiced and where you became a judge, and 
that's a different experience than being a judge or a lawyer in a in a huge city. You know, they they both have things to say. You know, to to speak for themselves. You know, to being a, a lawyer in New York, you're going to have extremely sophisticated yeah. cases, obviously, and uh, or Chicago or Los Angeles or something. Um, but there are other joys that are part of being a lawyer in, or a judge in a place like Jacksonville, or in my case, Sacramento. Um, let's just talk about that a little bit, because we, we both have, I think, have, we have similar views. Well, uh, well, give me that, about New York, a classmate, Gary Stein, was on, uh, wound up in the New Jersey Supreme Court, but he'd been practicing five years at Cahill Gordon, and I'm up there on business. This is back... 61 or 2. And I said, Gary, how long did it take for you to have an identity in New York? He said about five years. But at any rate, so here, uh, Jacksonville was a city of about 320,000 and the county maybe 400. Uh, and so uh, everybody's sort of a generalist. You're doing all kinds of things, what I'm trying to say. Uh, from the, in those days, in the criminal practice, for example, you were appointed by a judge. Out of your, the federal court the judge would call you and say, uh, Joe Flatt, it's your turn to come to arraignment. And you'd wind up with three or four or five clients, and you got no pay. If you, went, if you lost and went to New Orleans on appeal, you paid your own way to New Orleans. You had paid to have the briefs. That was just part of being a lawyer, and that was the obligation of the courts. But the point is, you... You learned, you got involved in the community heavily uh, and and learned uh, lots of different skills in, the, in that way, I think. And you knew everybody, I think. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think this I, sort of the idea of the lawyer as uh, sort of the, the glue person, you know, in the, in the local community that you kind of, you know, the bankers and you know, the workers and you know, the newspapers and you know, you know a lot of people. Well, that's right, and I, as I tell clerks, uh, I've been telling them this for 50 years, if you went to a top, medium-sized city, like Jacksonville was, or you went to Savannah, or you went to uh, Pensacola, or you went to Durham, or, or, or Raleigh, uh, and you read the newspaper, the local newspaper for, say, two or three years, and you followed uh, crime and you followed litigation, let's say, disputes and one thing or another, you would always see the names of five or six lawyers seem to be doing everything. Mm -hmm. uh, they were involved in the controversial cases of all sorts. They were maybe involved in, with the government. Uh, they were involved in civil rights matters. Uh, maybe in criminal cases. They just seem to be popping up. And these are the great generalists, I call them. And they really, the wise people, the wise men, uh, seems like everybody searches them out, especially in the difficult kinds of cases. And when and sitting on the bench, the, the greatest lawyers you see come out of small smaller places. They don't come from New York or Washington, D.C. or Chicago or someplace. Because they're departmentalized law firms, and and they sort of have tunnel vision as a way. No matter how smart they are, they've been doing the same thing over and over, and so so you have an argument from one of these lawyers from Montgomery, Alabama, or or Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, we used to sit in Fort Worth or Jackson, Mississippi, let's say, and they have a presence about them, in the sense of the, they're not nervous about anything. They're in full command of their presence. You've seen that. Uh, they give away uh, points that they should give away if they're the appellant. They just give away to the appellee. They just give away the points, and they they argue the, the justice of the case. They just, they just pick it out. They're having a conversation with the court. Uh, all of you are going to do moot court and when you do more court, moot court, you're going to make, you got your argument all fixed up. Remember that you're having a conversation with the court and you're trying to get the court to understand your position and you're trying, and it makes sense. 
your position makes sense. It has to make sense because if you're on the, the appellate court, writer, we got to write an opinion. And I tell lawyers in argument, I said, you want us to write an opinion that says that? What, what, what do you think it would look like on the front page of the Atlanta Constitution if it, if it said the 11th Circuit has just held X, Y, Z, what you want? You can't do that. So you were having this conversation, and, and these lawyers, that, uh, David, that just seem somehow to be able to carry the ball that way. Both sides, whether they're appellees or appellants, uh, and they shrink everything down. Every case has a centerpiece. Practice, practice of law sometimes is difficult with, with problems. Every problem is simple. Every problem is simple. What's difficult is making it simple. And so that's what these, these what I call these great lawyers, you might call them country lawyers. Yeah. Yeah, they're sort of. Well, Justice Jackson called them county seat lawyers, but he thought they, he thought they were disappearing. You, you and I are a little bit biased because, just because of our, our background and, and we, we practiced and we were judges in these smaller communities. And I think an, another, Another feature of them, in, in addition to the way the lawyers uh, interact with the community, is the way they interact with one another, because they yeah. see one another all the time. And so um, all the students in the room will become aware that when you, when you go out into practice, you'll find that the bench is extremely concerned about civility. And, uh, and part of that is just self-preservation, because if you have a bar that's at one another's throats all the time, they bring all these disputes to the courts, and they really gum up the works. And judges are are very mission oriented. They're trying to provide justice to the people of the of the of the region and the district. And it's not helpful to have these collateral suits going on all the time and accusations and uh, making the case, filling the case with friction. But we don't tend to see that in these small well, communities. Well, well, it it used to be that uh, you had a hard argument. <laughs> it's five o'clock and you leave the courthouse and both of you go. To, Cross the street and have a martini. Yeah. I mean, uh, why not? Or have dinner. Right. I'm, I'm serious. Well, because you're uh, see you playing golf together. I mean, and you might see them the next week, and you're on the same side. That I think that at least that's the way I've always thought of it. Is the difference is that in the in the bigger districts, the lawyers don't tend to know one another, and they're not necessarily going to see one another again, and and, and they're not going to be as good because. Great lawyers look at a broad picture. You unscrew your, your everybody has feelings about things. Uh, I will call them ideologies, that's too strong. But, but, it, but everybody has uh, notions or biases or whatever you want to call them. You just got to unscrew your head as a lawyer, put on, a, on another head that has a wide open mind, is not going to miss anything is going to deal with the unpleasant things. And they talk to each other that way. <laughs> so that's free, free. That's, otherwise you're going to, uh, it, you're not going to serve the client if you can't do that. And you don't have, I tell my law clerk, I'm the judge. I, I've got to do justice here. We're going to, we're going to analyze this problem. We're going to put it back together again. And I don't care what you think about it. <laughs> what I want you to do is be a lawyer. So I want you to look at every aspect of this matter without any feelings about it at all. And that's... That's uh, the key. And that's a, that's a skill. Yes. So, um, well, we've talked about the practice of law and being a judge in a smaller community. Uh, let's let's go back to the law school connection. Um, I want to obviously want to talk to you about your law clerks, but just before we do that, yeah. do you think it's important for a judge, for a lawyer, and for a judge to stay close to his or her law school, and and why? Well, I think it's it's part of the obligation of the profession as a whole. Uh, you're in a profession; it's not a business. That's one of the problems of, of the law practice tends to become a business it's, and not a profession. So you're in a profession and 
and the elite in the profession should be setting this, the, the tone. Uh, one of the problems, Yuval Levin has been writing about this subject, how uh, the leaders of professions, whether it's medical or law or whatever, sometimes go off on their own thing, and they're the leaders, and what happens is those underneath follow, and sometimes they follow on the wrong path. But I think as a matter of the profession, you have to, the, the law school you came from is the perfect place to be, it, to interact. And, and if somebody in my position, so I go other law schools to do jurist and residence or do classes or something or other, but, but uh, you have the roots, and this is the logical place. We want a, a conversation That's between it. the bench and the bar and the academy, I yeah. think. I, I think we both think that's really important. Oh, absolutely. I mean, maybe, maybe it's just too obvious to say, but um, it's good for judges to know what academic thinking is. And maybe that's one of the reasons you hire law clerks that are fresh out of law school and they've, just, they've been newly trained like young doctors. In theory, they have the best training. Well, I've had, I'm in my sixth decade of, of uh, hiring law school clerks. So I, I've seen every hairstyle, every face style, every clothing style, every, everything you can imagine. Okay. But as you go back through the years, I go back to the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and the 90s in this, this century, and you see different, you're following the, the, the progression of the generations, and you know how, how they're being taught in a way by the interaction with with the law clerks from one year to the next. Uh, and, and, and you're also learning about uh, how they see themselves uh, as a future lawyer, uh, which, is, which is an interesting thing. Do you see the same thing? Well, it's, of course you do, with, well, especially some, when you're teaching. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we do. Um, so the judges benefit from the law clerks having this you know, experience of law yeah. school, and it kind of keeps you fresh, and they, they help you uh, with academic... And you and you got to interact with the academy. That's the, so well, that's what I the academy that, gets out of it. I, mean, I, I think that's indispensable, because we're more in a greater reality than when you're teaching in law school, unless you're also doing things on the side so much. So I think that's very important. And I think it's very important for judges uh, to be in communion with the bar. Uh, in the federal circuits, uh, we used to have a circuit conference. All the, all the judges in the conference would meet with five or 600 lawyers for three days every year. Uh, <laughs> the government started running out of money about, <laughs> about, about a dozen or 15 years ago. And so they've started skipping these conferences to every other year. And it was absolutely imperative in my, in my judgment. In the first place, you have new judges coming aboard. So you have to meet frequently. It, it's very important to interact frequently. And then you have to interact with the bar because the bar is the resource that the court relies on. Uh, to administer justice, I mean, so they got to be together. They're all they're officers of the court, so you have to have it's a three way thing. You have the judges and the lawyers together, and the academy. They're all together, really. Have to be. Do Do you think there's a gap between the world of the academy and the world of the of the judge today? Have you seen any changes over your? A little bit of change in the sense of of what the law clerks communicate. So to the extent that the academy is changing, let's say, I'll put it bluntly, say objectivity in, in, the breadth of, in the breadth of teaching. To the extent that the academy is falling down on the breadth of teaching, uh, full interchange of ideas and all those kinds of things. You see that uh, little by little in the law clerks. Uh, so then, <laughs> then you have to, I, I start the teaching. When my clerks come to see me, come to my chambers in August, they all come in August. 
We have two weeks of, of indoctrination. <laughs> <laughs> and the, and the, for, the, for, two, for two weeks, I tell them, political correctness is not in these chambers. I don't, there is no political correctness. Zero. If you have an idea, I want to hear about it. If you have an idea and you think this Cole Clark City across the table, that uh, you're smarter than this other clerk, and so you don't want to offend the clerk. I say, you're going to go ahead and offend the clerk because I want to hear about it. And so, uh, so, so we have lunch every day around a library table and, and, and engage in, we pick out cases or issues that are a lot of, a lot of issues in today's world are ethical issues. They have to do with moral issues. There are a lot of things that go on in the law practice, the way lawyers act and the way cases are tried and one thing or another, that implicate values. Uh, morals is the best way to, I can think about putting it. So, so you're always asking the clerks, what is this? There's no rule for this. I'm working on five cases right now that have deep uh, ethical problems that are beneath the surface. In other words, the lawyers are arguing up here and the ethical problems are underpinning everything. And uh, they won't talk about it. So, but we have to talk about it because we have to do justice and we have to get the bottom of the problem. So then I say to the clerks, what is your, we don't have a black rule here, there's nothing in the, in the, in the law of, the canons of ethics or anywhere else that tells you this is right and this is wrong. So what is the source of right and wrong? So they st start talking about the source underpinning the, the rules of ethics. And when you engage in that kind of a conversation, you forget about your ideas about this, that, and the other thing. Because you're, you're right down to, 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 to basics. And that's what you have to do. And that's what judging is required. And so there has to be an interchange of ideas. And, and you start out by, with that attitude in the law school, basically. A, a, a judge lives in the world of, in the adversary world. So there's always a proponent and there's always an opponent. And uh, I'm sure you've had the experience, I know I did, where I would read a brief and I would say, wow, the, this is so convincing, there can't be an answer to this. And then you'd read the other brief and you'd say, wow, <laughs> this is so convincing. Yeah, so I can't wait to re read the reply brief. And then you just, you just sit there and say, I'm really confused. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's true. And sometimes the answer is not in either brief. <laughs> that's true, too. Uh, that, that's not uncommon at all. So, sometimes they're both in agreement, and then you'd be suspect. Yeah. <laughs> one of the, uh, I would say one of the gaps or one of the differences um, that I've noticed over time, and I don't think I'm the only one who's noticed this, is that most academics who study judges uh, will say that judges act, uh, they'll say that judges act politically, and they'll support this with a certain amount of statistics. Um, and they'll try to relate the decisions of the judge to the party of the appointing president if it's they're looking at the federal system or the party of the appointing governor if they're looking at the state system. Whereas judges, oh, judges do not think um, that they decide cases politically and they find this extremely offensive. Um, and it's, this is a hard discussion to have. Hey, what? You see it in the newspaper. There, here's a decision. Uh, so and so appointed this judge and this judge and so and so appointed this one, and which is really bad. Uh, some people think, I don't know, we're in the profession, I'll put it that way, that would be everybody. They think <laughs> we're on the Court of Appeals and we have bench memoranda or we've read the briefs that, and made up your mind. That's a, that is a belief that is pretty widespread. You've made up We've made up our minds. I will tell you from my own experience that at least 50% of the oral arguments I've ever heard, what I may have thought ahead of time is wrong. Because the oral argument, that's the, this conversation between bench and bar, 
it, it starts surfacing what really the, the issue in the case is, and sometimes it's hidden altogether. Um, but I think it, it's not possible to write opinions that say one and one turn out to be three. Yeah. So, that's usually the first draft. That's the first draft. <laughs> So, so, so you have to ha you have to have an open mind. You're looking for the the answer to a problem. All judges are dealing with problems, and you have to have it. You're looking for an answer. So it's it's like you have a a ruby cube that's jammed together. You got to take it apart and put it back together again. And it doesn't look like it did beforehand. So you know you've hired a hundred and ten. Duke Law students to be your law clerk, and then there have been a few from lesser schools, <laughs> <Yeah. to> lesser, <laughs> lesser places, um, which is only fair. Um, what do you hope your law clerks will get from the year with you? Well, historically, my experience from the Duke Law School has been they've been fairly balanced in their approach to the law, without without a without an agenda that's bent them out of shape. Now, I have run in some of those. It takes about six months to pound it out of them. <laughs> uh, I remember one time I had a, uh, a a clerk who had a PhD in economics. He taught economics for ten years in university, and uh, we had we had a case. He said, "Judges, it was an antitrust case. We can get him to decide this." And he had some damn antitrust case. He wanted some issue. He wanted. I said, "No." No, John, we, we can't do that. that this case, that's not in this case. <laughs> and about a month, he figured out it wasn't in this case. Yeah. So if we had written the opinion, with that in the case, a sophisticated reader knows, Joe Flat, you've gone off in left field, or right field, or someplace field, over the fence. <laughs> and uh, that, that, this case doesn't involve that. So, uh, but work, I know that working with your clerks, this is just uh, such a, a, the joy that you have in that. Yeah. Uh, you, you've conveyed that uh, over time. I know you have, you have a, every five years you have a reunion, yeah. and you're very close to your law clerks over time. Why don't you talk about what they've meant to you in your life? Well, I write a, a year-end letter, and right before New Year's, it, it tells what the court as a whole has been doing because they know the judges and uh, so forth and so on. I introduce them to new judges. Uh, I tell them what some of them have been doing. Uh, for example, I, I, somebody, the clerk back in the 80s, uh, I'll, I'll say something because a bunch of people in the, who clerked in the 80s will know this individual. Uh, and then you just follow their careers. Uh, I think I know Probably out of the 200 and some, probably I know where 175 are, uh, how many children they have, what what they're doing. Uh, I've had a former law clerk who became dean of a, a law school, uh, and I did his first commencement as, as dean, and he turned around and hired <laughs> another law clerk from a different era. Uh, and then I've sworn in law clerks as, as judges, which is a very warm thing. Uh, and then you, you enjoy their successes. Some have changed their professions. Uh, one law clerk decided to go to engineering school. Uh, went off teaching engineering in Pennsylvania, in Pennsylvania for a Philadelphia firm. Another one went to medical school. Uh, so they do diff sometimes different things. Uh, one is a writer. Uh, it's a family. Yeah, it's sort of a family. That's really nice. Um, yeah. When when they're there for the year, you you, you mentioned that you you have this two week um, Joe Flat boot camp. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and then uh, what? What what do they do over the course of the year, and, and how do you how do you interact with them? Well, for, first I tell them in this day and age, I said, in August I say 
in October, you won't recognize the United States. And then in October, I say, uh, in March, you won't recognize in the world, which we're living in, fairly volatile. Uh, we, we work on these cases, and some of them are more complicated than others, and so the door's always open, so it's in and out proposition. And sometimes they gang up on me. I mean, the, the clerk disagrees with where I am. And so they're back in the bullpen. Uh, and then I, we have a confrontation. And, uh, and, and so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, for them it's a learning process. You know, some go this way, some go that way. And, uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. I would say one out of five, maybe two out of five, will, will get in touch with me within two years or three at the most and say, Judge, what you said it was going to be like out here is exactly right. I would say it's even more than that. Uh, that uh, because I tell them what they're going to run into, and that and that they're going to be called on to do things that they ought not do. Because some senior person doesn't want to put their name on it, so they give it to an associate. And, uh, so they're going to have some hard choices to make. Uh, they you, they always call me when they. Because of indebtedness, uh, they get signing bonuses because they clerk. Plus, uh, the big big firms in D.C. or New York or wherever, and they'll stay there two or three years and want to go back to Arkansas or someplace. And they'll always call and talk about uh, what life is like. Uh, one of the, it's one of one of the things that the, they are concerned about being in a tunnel vision kind of, in a in departmental. It's a matter, matter of economics of law practice. You've got to have departments and law firms. People, you can't be reinventing the wheel uh, every day. So you, there's some repetition. And, they, and sometimes I think they think they're cabined. So they talk about that. So some, some, some judges have gone to hiring permanent clerks. And you have not. You have. They Never. Turn, they turn over to you. Could you. Can you? Can you talk about that? Oh, I just. Uh, in the first place, if you make a mistake, it's awful. Of course, the person who's the permanent clerk has has left everything else, and so you're. Uh, you you got a, a problem. Uh, if you discharge the clerk, they're out there, and uh, that pro that's a that's a. Death knell maybe on their career, uh, and then sometimes they think they're judges. I've told, I've called a couple of career law clerks, or other judges. I'll just say, judge, they, you got that one wrong, you know, or just, just <laughs> tongue in cheek kind of thing. So, uh, and I think they ought to move on. And when they come out of law school, you clerk and move on. The lawyers are a bundle of skills. You learn some skills here, and you learn some skills here, and you learn other skills in various and sundry settings. So, so lawyers, the young lawyers, want to get involved in as much as they can, like in the community, like you were saying earlier, because you pick up all kinds of interpersonal skills, uh, which are very important in this interpersonal society in which we kind of live. So let, you've done a lot of mentoring, and you've helped so many generations of law clerks. Who mentored you? Uh, who did you look when you came on and said you were a, you were a young judge, fifty four years ago? Oh boy! And who were who were your judicial heroes? Your, well, your judicial models. Well, there was Albert Tuttle and Warren Jones, and a couple more that were born in eighteen ninety. And, and then there was uh, Chief Justice Berger and, and uh, Lewis Powell and, and a couple more colleagues uh, born before 1910. Okay. And then uh, two or three that were in the First World War. 
And, and uh, they, so they're 30, 40 years older than I am. And they from all kinds of walks of life. And so you just pick up all sorts of things and, and uh, a, a lot of wisdom about things not to do. You're, as a young judge, for example, you learn early on, and probably just by osmosis from this crowd, that you never enter an order you can't enforce. And why do you not enter an order you can't enforce? Because you bring disrespect to the rule of law. Because you disappoint the litigants before you. If you, inf if you enforce it, you make a terrible mistake and, get it and, and create some more problems for the public at large. Just little simple things like that. So some of the judges you mentioned were part of the group that dealt with... Uh, the desegregation cases yes. of the 1950s, and that was a very brave group yeah. of people. And I, I joined that crowd. You joined that crowd, and yeah. they they were they took a lot of um, there was a lot of pressure on them from their community. And I will t you would talk about who pointed whom. I will tell you this: that nobody would have thought about who appointed this judge or that judge. I don't even think it would be in the newspaper. These were very serious matters involving widespread effect on communities. You're talking about turning cultures upside down. And I don't ever recall, I, I don't recall ideologies. I don't recall uh, this one appointed me or this or politics or anything like that. As a matter of fact, <laughs> the judges were against all the, all the politicians. But, I mean... In those days, what had happened was, and this is one of the reasons why the federal courts got so so busy starting in the 70s, is that uh, state legislatures and executive branches, the Congress and the executive branch of the federal government, were not solving some problems. So everybody was running to the federal court. So we're desegregating schools. They could have been desegregated by other courts and other, uh, other devices or all kinds of things, or, or cases involving insane asylums, uh, cases involving the juvenile justice systems, all those things. They were all solvable uh, in, in local government. So, uh, so all, everybody started running the federal courts. And so what I'm saying is uh, lots of people didn't like what the judges were Well, they liked what the judges were doing because they were relieving them of the problem, yeah. uh, which in a way is... Say in a deuce, in a de I had a Jacksonville desegregation case with 130,000 students in a, in a territory the size of Rhode Island, two thirds the size of Rhode Island, to give you some idea of the, of the size. And, and one thing you always keep in mind is that the school board has the obligation to run a constitutional school system, not me. They got to run the system. That's their job. If I take over their job, I'm demeaning the local government and doing lots of other mischief. So what you do is, is, you, is you make it possible for them to do their job, ugly as it is, you, they're going to do their job, and you're going to do as least as possible, keeping in mind that I have to enforce an injunction, I'm not going to overreach. So that's how you do. Frank Johnson did that in Alabama. In all those cases, very narrow the de decision, reserving the power to enforce, but trying to make local government do the job because that was their constitutional obligation. And in today's world, uh, when judges make uh, other branches of government in the separation of powers, we don't want to do Congress's job. And we don't want to do the executive branch job. When you do the executive branch job or Congress's job by, by filling in the blanks of legislation, say, you're demeaning that branch of government. You're saying you don't have to wrestle with this problem. Or the executive branch, you don't have to wrestle with it. Or in the state governments, you don't have to wrestle with this problem. We'll handle it with sweeping injunctions, uh, which is sometimes we see which are very unwise, and they call all, cause all kind of consternation. So when you, yeah. when you look back at this astonishing career that you've had of 
service to the nation, 54 years of judging. What, what do you see as your, as, as the greatest challenges, the greatest challenges that you confronted, and let's just say your greatest accomplishments? I, I think uh, I've been pretty good at efficiency of, of trying to make the system work, which is, involves a procedural law and due process and lots of things. And making it work so that people can solve problems and that local government can do its job, uh, I think that's, that's what I've tried to do the most, uh, other than just deciding. You, you do that while you're deciding cases. But, but, but and creating, and in the bar, uh, uh, trying to create good conversation between the bench and bar and that goes beyond the immediate case, because that's what this is all about anyway. The, the, whole, the whole system of justice, however you look, it's a bit, to me it's a big blob, the system of justice and the law. Just, uh, it, it's, it's, it's conversation with a lot of policy and you arrive at the policy through conversation. That's all law is anyway, just policy. And we, we enforce the policy. Sometimes it's made by the, by the executive branch or by the, the legislative branch. And we make policy in the minute, you, like you did on the district court. You manage cases, you're making your own policy. You're a common law judge in the way in which you go about your business. Oh, it's so important. And you've done, you've been so spectacular. Um, I don't know if you'll have another 110 law clerks but, <laughs> from Duke, but it's certainly, uh, it's obviously a privilege to, uh, you know, to, to serve with you for that year. I know that some of them are here today. Yeah. Um, and just for the rest of us, you know, what an, what an honor to be in your presence and to hear your, your approach to judging. And just well, it's an honor to be here. How important that is. Like and back home. Your law school <laughs> loves you, and I think your law school has just yeah. benefited so much from your, your wisdom and your, your caring for the institution because that's, that's what it's all oh, about. Oh, it's, it's a jewel. It's the institution is a jewel. So let us, let us all thank Judge Joe <laughs> <Joseph. laughs>